Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. I am pleased to be able to bring to you Emily Flynn, who is an experienced legal nurse consultant, experienced working in the emergency department, and experienced working with attorneys behind the scenes as well as expert work. She has been doing legal nurse consulting since 2006. And we picked a topic today of creating stunning work product, because it is a question that comes up all the time when I am working with legal nurse consultants as a business coach is, how do I put together my thoughts? How can I make myself stand out? What are attorneys looking for when they come to me and they say, I want a chronology or a medical summary? And what are some of the tricks and tips of the trade to make this a product that you will be proud of and will get you more business. Emily, let's start by welcoming you to the show. I'm so pleased that you could join me today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm I'm honored to be on one of your podcasts. I've I've followed you for years and am in awe of your work. So I appreciate this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you. I know that People have lots of questions that we'll try to anticipate as we go through this. And at the end of the podcast, I'll I'll ask you to share your contact information if somebody has a desire to reach out to you and find out more about your services. Let's start with the basics of how do you create chronology specifically? What type of software should legal nurse consultants use? Well, I started out pretty simple and I still um, am pretty simple in what I use. I use Microsoft Word uh, for my um, writing material. I have usually used a template um, like a a table that my chronology goes into. So having a knowledge of how the tables work, um, formatting um, those comes in handy. Adobe uh, Acrobat is the software that I do use for the records um, that I read and copy and paste into my chronology. So that is one subscription that I do uh, have monthly in order to use those records. Um, But I use Word mostly for my actual work product for the actual chronology. I also use Word for other documents such as missing record documents, things like that, that we'll go into. I have used Excel in the past for different types of work products like billing records, different things that clients might need. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's pretty much it for, for software, nothing real fancy. And when you are putting information into a table in Word, do you insert rows and keep the data chronological by date and time, or do you use a sort function afterwards? Usually I will use a, uh, you can use a sort function. There's a a function within Word that you can uh, sort at the top of the chronology, a little arrow pops up and you can sort that according to date. Um, A lot of times I will try to organize my records when I get started to kind of know um, you know, kind of starting at the date of injury and working my way down. So I kind of am not all over the place. Um, So that's kind of how I keep things organized. Um, It it depends on how you're working your chronology, whether you're doing one event or you're doing a whole uh, slew of records as far as keeping the the storyline in order. But it is uh, useful to have a word for organizing uh, those timelines for you. You can also order the, uh, the I keep a list of records at the top, and then you can organize those alphabetically as well. You can organize um, those so those are um, ordered correctly. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. When I think about chronologies, um, I think it's helpful to define what the attorney means. When the attorney says, mm-hmm. Hey, Emily, can you do a chronology for me? What kinds of questions should you ask of the client when you get that type of a request? Well, you want to know, first of all, what what they want included, how detailed they want it to be. 
Uh, some clients, some I've also worked for companies that want absolutely everything in there, every word, every um, uh, detail. Other clients or companies want just the basics. Like you may have a, a office visit and you may start your first office visit with the medical history, the uh, all the data. And then on a follow-up visit, you could skip that medical history, skip the medication list, not be as detailed for each subsequent visit. So you want to keep things maybe a little bit uh, more concise. So you're not repeating information every time on a record, like from a doctor's office that has 50 visits, you're not going to maybe repeat the medical history every time unless you have significant changes. You also may want to know, does that attorney want like you have a date of injury, say in 2020, and then you also have medical records in 2018. Does he want those records in the chronology um, or does he want those in a table listing these are pre-existing? So you need to know those types of things. It sounds like what you're saying is to be very clear on the purpose of the chronology and the focus. Have you ever been asked to do a more focused chronology, maybe... Um, if there's an incident, looking at events leading up to an incident? And yes, I'm thinking more, incident, right, more along the lines of that would be, might be more along the lines of medical malpractice. So if you have, say, like an, um, an, an injection in a hospital, uh, a medication error, you might be more focused on, they may just want to look at a snapshot of that hospitalization, uh, all the records leading up to that error, like if it's a surgical um, case or what happened with all the pharmacy nursing records, that could be a specific chronology just with that incident. So that could be a chronology specifically for that uh, incident that happened without all the preceding records, without all the follow-up uh, sequela of that injury. I think this is one of the areas where you can be creative as a legal nurse consultant in figuring out what details to include or what type of chronology. When we were getting ready for this podcast, I was talking with you about a case that I've been working on where I did a chronology comparing different witnesses in the room about mm -hmm. what happened at what time. And that very clearly points out discrepancies in testimony mm -hmm. I've also done a chronology by looking at what the medical record said as the times and then what the witnesses said, often, again, uncovering discrepancies that are quite revealing for the attorney in looking at trying to figure out what happened. Because, you mm -hmm. know, all of us are working on cases where we are coming along after the fact. We're not involved mm -hmm. in these incidents, fortunately. And then it becomes a matter of figuring out who did what, when, and that can be crucial in a case. That brings a good point when you talk about discrepancies, uh, especially I have a history or a background of, of doing expert witness work where you are looking for, you know, what, where is the moment where this went wrong? When you're doing a chronology, um, you are looking for, you know, that date of injury or what happened. Um, if it's malpractice, you're looking for, um, that specific incident, but you do find as you go along um, discrepancies where this record is saying this happened, another medical record may say something else happened, or different uh, entries in a record uh, do say different things, and you're including those ent entries and marking those specifically so the attorney's eye catches that marking that as a discrepancy. You're not putting that as an opinion. You're putting that as a discrepancy. This is this is what this record says, or this is what this uh, author says. This is what this entry says. Um, it just makes it clear cut. Um, looking hindsight, this is what has happened. And this is what we found in the record. So that's a really, that's a, why, why a chronology is such a valuable tool. It takes all these the hundreds, sometimes thousands of pages of medical records and brings it into a clear picture of what happened and also the uh, particular points of interest that you, they really need to see. Well, and we could be working with thousands of papers or thousands right. of pages, whether they're physical 
increasingly less so physical mm -hmm. pieces of paper or electronic files, I would imagine that personal injury attorneys have come to you and said, Emily, can you do a chronology of this client's injuries? Where do you even start when you've got thousands of pages? Well, we usually receive the records. Right now, they're all electronic. A lot of times I receive them through like Dropbox or just in a file downloaded. I keep them on my computer in files, uh, under subfiles uh, that are attached to the attorney or the firm. And then I keep them into a file based on that client's name. And I go through them right off the bat to see what files I have. I look for where I want to start based on uh, if it's like a personal injury, was this an, a car accident? So you want to look for, do I have the EMS records, the fire police reports? Usually a police report is the first um, and a really good record to look at because they'll have a diagram of the car crash. Mm -hmm. They'll have uh, sometimes even witness statements. They'll have a, everything that you need to start that chronology uh, with the police report, times of dispatch, uh, weather conditions, everything that you put into that first entry is the um, the start of the accident. Then you may have the EMS picks up the um, the patient from the police, takes so you put the EMS report in, then where are they taking them? It tells you taking them to you know such and such general hospital. So then you look for that record and start with that record and go through to the emergency department visit, you know, then make sure you include all the relevant radiology reports, lab reports, are they admitted? Then you start with the admission history, consults, are there surgeries? All the way through that record. Then sometimes they will be going to inpatient rehab. So you may look for that rehab hospital record. When they come out, are they having home health care? Do they have physical therapy? You just kind of go into an ordered, I like to try to stay as ordered as possible. So I don't physically put those records in any uh, order because they are just their files on my computer, but I just visualize what those records are. And then as I review them, I make another little file that says reviewed. And as I reviewed them, I put them aside. So I know that I've already gone through them and I can come back if I want to, but then I have the rest of my files set aside to review that I know I still need to go through. It's a very orderly process you're describing. Right. I, I try. You have to you have to try to be organized so you don't miss anything. Absolutely. And going back to EMS for a moment, we have listeners to our podcast in many countries around the world. Last time I checked, 95 countries. They might not wow. be familiar with the abbreviation EMS. Can you break that down for us and tell us? Of the people who arrive at the scene, what are the different layers that could be involved? Because you might have more than one EMS provider at the scene. Tell us what EMS stands for and what we should be looking for in terms of making sure that we've got all of those records. So EMS stands for Emergency Medical Services. So that encompasses uh, sometimes fire department will be the first on scene. Sometimes it'll be a paramedic uh, and a paramedic is separate title from EMS or uh, EMT, which is emergency medical technician. So on an ambulance vehicle, you will have two, uh, usually two employees, a paramedic and an EMT, which is a, a level below emergency medical technician. So you kind of look at who the author of the report is. Usually they'll have both of the names on there, and I will include that in the record. Paramedics are usually the ones giving the drugs, giving all the treatments. The emergency medical technician is usually the one driving the, the ambulance back to the hospital, but will help on scene, of course. Fire department. I don't see a lot of fire department records because they are usually on scene helping. They usually submit a record. So honestly, don't see a lot of fire department records. The police records are um, like the police department records really aren't considered as the EMS. They are usually the ones that are filing the injury report with Colorado State, you know, Colorado. Um, one of my clients is in Colorado, uh, Colorado Department of Traffic. Or so you you put you know where your record is from, who the author is, Deputy Brown. Um, other um, first responders. That's pretty much it as far as um, 
like I said, I don't consider the police to be uh, part of the EMS system. It's mostly the the paramedics and the emergency medical technicians. And then, as I said, I really don't often see fire records, I guess, unless there was a fire uh, um, disaster type thing at the actual residence. And then what is the difference between BLS responders and ALS responders? Before we continue with the show, I'd like to share this special announcement with you. How do you get your first legal nurse consulting case? I'm Pat Iyer, and I've been a legal nurse consultant since 1987. And what matters to you is that I've walked in your path. I've wondered how to get my first LNC case. So that you can see how varied the legal nurse consulting path can be, I present stories of three of my colleagues, highly successful legal nurse consultants. Here's the first one. In my childhood, I wanted to be Perry Mason. While I was home having babies, I received a brochure for a seminar on legal nurse consulting. Later, I realized I was interested in the law, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. When I saw this brochure, I wondered if this could be the niche for me. I called five lawyers I knew to ask if they had ever heard of legal nurse consulting and if they thought there was a need for this kind of work. I received two cases from five calls and I was in business. That's the story of Mindy Cohen, who started Mindy Cohen and Associates and rebranded her company to On Point LNC. She successfully sold her company. Let's see how another LNC got started. While waiting to catch a flight at the Richmond International Airport, I started a conversation with a fellow passenger. We discovered we were both nurses. Diana was working as a nurse paralegal at a local defense firm. She was happy to learn that I worked full-time in a post-anesthesia care unit at a tertiary teaching hospital. She asked if I had ever done expert witness work. I had no idea what she meant. Diana explained the role briefly to me as she gave me her business card. Send me your resume when you get back. We're always looking for nurses to review cases. I stuck the card in my purse. I spent a few hours polishing the document and sent it to Diana. She promptly thanked me and said she would keep me in mind for future cases. Six months went by and I heard nothing. Then the phone rang, it was Diana, and she had a case she wanted me to consider reviewing. I agreed. Dana Jolly is based in Virginia and runs a successful LNC business. And our last story is from nurse midwife Shirley White Walker. She said in 1986, while I held a dual position of certified nurse midwife and hospital administrator in the OBGYN department at a major teaching hospital, a colleague approached me to review a medical malpractice case involving a nurse midwife. I remember being surprised that she would ask me primarily because I had no clue what I was supposed to do. I had no knowledge of the role and the function of an LNC. I was concerned about being qualified to meet the attorney's needs due to the inexperience I had in my field. Ultimately, I contacted the attorney who was based in Florida and represented the plaintiff. At that point, I embarked on a journey that would change my life. If you like these stories, you'll find a whole lot more as well as tips to get started in my new book, Get Your First LNC Case. You'll find it at lnc.tips forward slash creating series. Order the instant download or use the button to head to Amazon for the paperback or Kindle copy. Don't wait any longer to start. Now let's return to the show. So BLS is basic life support and ALS is advanced life support. And it's the difference in how they respond to the hospital. So if, a, say, a patient uh, was in a car, a person was in a car accident and, you know, had, had some neck pain, um, wasn't very severely injured, but they did want to be checked out at the hospital, that would probably be BLS uh, transport, meaning they're not probably going to be on a cardiac monitor uh, 
not needing advanced life support to transport that patient. A patient that's considered a trauma with multi-level injuries, that's going to be on a cardiac monitor, that's going to be receiving intravenous therapy, that's going to be receiving medications is considered an ALS transport or advanced life transport, uh, advanced um, life support transport. They also look at that if they're transporting patients between facilities, you always have to clarify when you need transport, whether it's going to be ALS or BLS transport. And usually once a patient's already in the hospital, they're going to need ALS transport because you're going to be needing that patient to be monitored and such. So a lot of times I will also see, you have to clarify when you see a record from a, like a EMS um, sometimes a patient will be transferred to another hospital. You have to make sure you are looking at the initial report, not maybe a transfer report, because I will re- I will see those as well. You may not, you may be in a, more, a rural setting, and a person's been in a car accident. Now they need to be transferred to a trauma center, so they'll get started in the emergency department and then are transferred to another facility. So you may see multiple. Uh, EMS records. So you have to make sure you're looking at the the dates, the times. And I will often include times under the dates on my chronologies, especially with that first um, date of injury, because that helps the chronology to see what time it happened when they arrived at, you know, at what happened on scene and when they arrived at the ER, then are they going to another facility kind of goes along with the whole chronology of the sequence of times. And to throw in another concept, we might have helicopter life flight yes. records also, particularly. Yes, for I forgot that one. Medicine. You're right. Yes, yes, life flight. You're correct. I personally haven't seen that, but you're absolutely correct. I marvel at the people who do that type of work yes. because I think about the confined space in a helicopter and the yes. turbulence in the air and the severity of the condition of the patient, and yet there's a beautifully typed document at the end of that flight. Yes. And that's a skill to be starting that IV in a moving vehicle. Believe me, I know a lot of medics mm. <laughs> and that some of them say they can't even start the IV. It's a standstill. They like to do it on the run. That's how they <laughs> function. So that's yeah, that's a skill. So we all have our skills. <clears throat> You mentioned about making sure that you have all the records. What should you do if you find out that you're missing records? So that is part of what we as what we provide the attorney is um, as they receive records when they start a case from um, from the providers that they are asking for the records. We will delve into all the records given and find missing records. Like uh, they may mention that. You know, the patient is, you know, just had a car accident. They're recovering from a knee surgery. Well, we want to, the patient just had knee surgery. We want to get those knee surgery records if it happened, you know, recently. We don't necessarily need all the previous medical history records. Depends on how detailed that client wants to be. Some clients want medical uh, previous records going back a few years. Some don't. And then also as you're going through uh, the records subsequent to the injury, you'll see them say uh, patients being referred to physical therapy. Well, if you don't have those physical therapy records, you need to, to I, I usually start a separate document and say patient referred to, say if it says like touchstone physical therapy, write that name down and the date of when they're supposed to start. And it is an added service if you can find the actual address and a phone number to include that for the attorney. And um, any consultations, pharmacies, if it says, you know, going, you know, prescription sent to CVS pharmacy and you don't have pharmacy records, that's something also you wanna include. Uh, Any records that you're not finding, um, you may even have a doctor's visits, but it's, they're with another physician's record because sometimes physicians get office visits like sent to them because they're the primary doctor. So they may get consultation records and you'll receive those in the primary care doctor's record, but you want to get those, uh, the records from the physician, the original records. So you need to ask for those. You don't just take the records because they're all in one lump record uh, file. You want to make sure you get the original records from each provider. 
A real important point, because that may be only bits and pieces of that other provider's file, and they might have notes that are germane right. about the patient. And I know you've alluded to this of knowing the attorney's preferences. Why is that so important? And I remember a legal nurse consultant several years ago said to me, well, I want to do my chronology the way that I want to do it. Do I have to pay attention to what my client tells me about the way that he wants me to do it? Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah, I certainly have a preference. I I learned to do these a long time ago, but um, and I have a, a preferred way. But uh, certain chrono- offices and, and firms like their chronology is done a certain way, and I'll often ask them. Uh, if it's a new client, a new firm, can you send me a sample? And they will often send me a sample of how their firm does it, which is very helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll either redact it or take out names. Um, and then I can see what their um, the preferred format is, which is is very helpful. Um, if they don't really have a preferred format, I, can, I keep a work pro- sample myself with redacted, of course, and I can send them, especially as I'm getting to know them as a new client, I'll send them a work sample. And if they're happy with that, I will use that. But other preferences you want to ask them about, of course, what, what font, what, um, what size do you like the text to be in? Um, How do you want the important information uh, presented? Do you want it bolded? Do you want it in a different color? Uh, Do you want the uh, medical definitions and drug definitions, um, in the, in the text, like in parentheses, or do you want it off to the side? There's a, another column in the, in the table, like just asking them all these specifics. So when you turn it in there, they don't, they can't come back to you and say, Hey, I, I didn't want it this way. And then you have to redo that work because that, that wouldn't be appropriate to charge them for something you have to redo. Mm-hmm. And you just brought up about definitions and drug terms do you have a shortcut when it comes to that type of data? Yeah, so because I've been doing this for a long time, I keep some Word documents that are probably at least 50, 40, 50 pages of all of medical definitions. Like if you see ORIF, um, open reduction internal fixation, you see that in a uh, in a document, um, you want to you want to define that because it may seem like most of us know it, but it, it, these are not medical people. So mm-hmm. I keep that as one of my definitions uh, written out. So I will define that as well as like GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale is another very common one. Not only do I write out Glasgow Coma Scale, I define it like what is it? This is a neurological uh, tool that tells you it describes the level of consciousness of a patient. So some some defini- some abbreviations I just define, like what what G, um, what ORIF stands for. Some things like GCS, I actually uh, just tell them what the abbreviation is and define it. Like like uh, and also like an Aldredi score is an abbreviation, but I'll explain what an Aldredi score is, how it has to do with pre op preoperative uh, readiness, and then with medications. I've got an ongoing list of all the medications and what they what they are. Like um, duloxetine is an antidepressant. I don't get real involved, just antidepressant. And then that way, when you've got your long medication lists, um, you can copy and paste the definition. If it's something simple like Keflex, you just write anti- or antibiotic, that type of thing. And if there's something new, I find, I look it up and then I write it in my document and save it. So the next time I already have it. Yes. Yes, that makes sense. And that would save a lot of time when you're preparing chronologies. Yes. I used to capture medical abbreviations and put them into a document and then offer that as an opt-in offer on my website with attorneys Mm -hmm. being able to receive that list and paralegals liked it as well. And that Mm -hmm. helped build up my mailing list of attorneys by offering them medical abbreviations as a shortcut. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about drawing attention to significant information and asking the attorney's preferences. What are some of the ways that you handle that? Um, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Drawing attention to significant information that you found in the medical records. So... Sometimes it depends on, again, the preferences. I will 
highlight them. Sometimes they want them highlighted in yellow, like if this is the date of injury and they're talking about, uh, you know, patient was rear-ended and these are the injuries, uh, along with all the information about the condition of the, the vehicle and all that, you want to maybe highlight what the important information on that um, note is, the actual accident um, results. Uh, if it's a doctor's office visit, you may want to document. I have a client that wants me to, to highlight all the recommendations, like physician recommendations, recommending physical therapy, prescribing Flexeril. Um, again, that's a client preference. You need to ask them what what do you want me to, what do you want me to highlight and how do you want me to highlight it? So I may highlight it in, in just bold, like black bold. Some like it in red, and again, some want it highlighted. I have one client who likes me to highlight the whole, like if it's a diagnostic, like a CT, I I I shade the whole column or that whole row in like blue. If it's a um, procedure like a surgery, I highlight that whole column or row in orange. So they can, that really pops in the chronology. You can find the surgeries, you can find the CTs and x-rays. Uh, so again, that's a way to um, highlight the important points and it, it, it's very client specific. And then what do you do when you get additional medical records and you want to integrate them into the chronology? So I do a lot of with repeat with clients that uh, have ongoing cases, they will send me updates that, and that goes back to those missing medical records. You tell them what's missing. So then they're going to hopefully get those records. So I keep my chronologies, of course, all my work products for years. Uh, when they give me those missing records, I go in and I update those again, according to their preference. Usually I'll do that in like a blue Font, I'll, I'll add the records in blue. First of all, it helps me know what I need to edit once I put the new records in. I need to go back and edit it with the important information and all of that. So I, I edit those records, put them in in a different color, de depending on if they want it in a certain color. And I return it to them with a reminder of what those new records look like. Then if I get another update on that same case, I will take all those uh, old updated records, change them back to black, and then add new records again in blue or whatever the, the color is. Now I have two more questions for you, Emily. My next to the last question is, do you ever offer opinions in the chronology about the material that you are uncovering for the attorney? No, this, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not, an, it's not an opinion. It is the only thing I would ever, uh, I ever make comments on is like, if it's a discrepancy, like, you know, this, this doctor is saying that the patient's not a smoker, but if you, if I will note, if please note in like Dr. Brown's record, they noted that the patient was not a smoker. Dr. Jones is noting he is a smoker. So it's not an opinion, it's an observation. Mm -hmm. You will also may make st a statement like in a doctor's record uh, that say they visit a doctor and they just recently had the accident. You may note, note there's no mention of the accident in this visit. That's not an opinion, that's just a clarification that you know the patient's been complaining of all this pain, they've had this op, this, um, accident. Now they're visiting this doctor and there's no mention two weeks later of this accident, not an opinion, just an observation. So you're just making points, not opinions. Mm -hmm. And I often put that kind of information in a separate analysis letter to the attorney, not part of the chronology, but turned in at the same time to draw attention to specific points. Um, I've always been amazed in working on personal injury mm -hmm. cases that Sometimes the patient is seat belted. Sometimes the patient is not. Mm -hmm. um, I tracked a case once of a man who fell off a ladder and it started off being a three foot high ladder and it was 17 feet by the time I got through all the medical records. Like right. it's the same ladder. How come yeah. there's all these discrepancies? Right. That kind of thing is useful to put in a separate letter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've never been asked to do that, but that is something that you could expound on with the business is saying, you know, do you want my, my points uh, in another, uh, in a separate document or not, like you said, not really an opinion, but things that you're noticing, uh, drug seeking behavior uh, past, you know, this patient says they have, this doctor says no past history of injury, but 
in the past medical records, you're finding multiple work-related injuries, things mm-hmm. like that. You just want to point that out. Um, but that is an, an added service you can provide. Yes, and attorneys appreciate it because you're helping <laughs> them go through all the weeds to get to the destination. Right. And my last question, Emily, is how can a listener find out more about you and the services you offer or contact you? Well, I, my most, the best way to contact me probably is through LinkedIn. Um, and I have, I answer my email all the time, which is eflynnconsulting at gmail.com. Um, my LinkedIn profile, I keep up to date and I will put a link to this podcast on there. Uh, so it's, I'm Emily Flynn on LinkedIn. Um, and that's the best way to uh, reach out to me. Again, my business is E. Flynn um, Legal Nurse Consulting, LLC. So I've been working with that on a relatively small basis aside, aside to my hospital experience, but I'm working on expanding that and uh, getting some new exposure. So I, I'm eager to uh, meet some new people. Wonderful. And to clarify, Emily's last name is spelled F-L-Y-N-N. You probably mm-hmm. get F-L-I-N-N sometimes, Emily. Sometimes, Yes. You would be surprised what people can do with my last name of Iyer. Oh, I'm, Very I'm sure. I-Y-E-R, but it comes out as Iyer's, Tyler, Liar, you know, a whole bunch of things that are quite unpleasant. Right. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, Emily. You've given us some great strategies and concrete tips, which I know that our listener or the person watching this on our YouTube channel at Legal Nurse Business will be fascinated with the information that you've shared. Well, thank you so much for having me. I very much appreciate it. And I will remind you as a listener that if you want the transcript of this program to be able to refer to it, you can go to our website podcast section, which is podcast.legalnursebusiness.com. And you will find the show notes for this episode, Emily's contact information, a summary of the points that she provided and the ability to request the transcript so that you can refer back to the tips that Emily has given today. Be sure to come to the next episode of Legal Nurse Podcast with a new guest, new topic, and tell other LNCs about Legal Nurse Podcast. We are here to help you, to serve you, and to make your experience as a legal nurse consultant smoother more profitable with more growth and more opportunities. Thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome to Legal Nurse Podcast. I'm Pat Iyer, and with me is Diana Goodwin, who is a nursing administrator, who shared her thoughts with me this morning on some topics related to supervision and training of nursing employees. Diana, what were some of the topics that we covered in your podcast? Well, um, we covered challenges of managing people in the world of short staffing. Um, We also covered the importance of hiring qualified candidates and making sure that they get appropriate training. And then we also covered communicating um, safety concerns and how to train nurses in following Um, the chain of command when they are in a situation that um, presents a safety concern for a patient. And Diana ended her story or shared her story in the podcast by ending her podcast, talking about a situation involving a chain of command incident and how it escalated and how it got resolved. You're not going to want to miss hearing that story. It's something that you won't forget. Be sure to catch Diana Goodwin's podcast coming up next on Legal Nurse Podcast and enjoy the tips and the insight that she shares from that nursing management position. Come back soon. Take care. Thank you.